Okay, we're going to move on to uh, slide 13 of speech delivery. And we're going to talk about vocalized pauses. These are not purposeful things. These are mistakes. They're called vocal fillers. You want to avoid them as much as you are humanly possible, humanly able to do it. Uh, these, when a speaker says, uh, er, um, hey, I'm guilty of it too. Try, if you feel that um coming, you're thinking, try to not say it. You know when it's about to happen, just refrain from saying it, then go on, okay? It's hard, it's hard to do, it's hard to do, and we, we all do this, but try to eliminate that from your speaking. Moving on to 14, uh, vocal variety. Now, you'll notice that I mentioned that a lot. VV, I call it in my evaluations of you. Vocal variety. It's changes in rate, pitch, and volume. And it gives <clears throat> your voice its expressiveness. If you have a lot of vocal variety in your talking, then no one can accuse you of speaking in a monotone. The monotone is I'm talking like this and I'm not expressing anything in particular because I'm not changing the variety or the pitch or anything like that. If I want to make something stand out, I am going to emphasize some words. I'm going to speak some words more clearly than other words. I am going to speak some words a little more slowly than other words. Uh, I'm going to raise my voice, the volume and the pitch and the rate. All of these things you can control. You have to read, not, not just read, but you have to deliver your speech knowing what needs to be emphasized. This is especially important in a persuasive speech, but it is also important in every other kind of speech. So moving on to 15, pronunciation. It doesn't matter where you're from in the United States, you're gonna have some kind of an accent to somebody. Uh, when I moved here many, many years ago uh, from the Midwest, I had trouble understanding people. Uh, I'm getting more used to it now after 30 years, but um, <laughs> it takes a while to, to understand uh, what people are saying. I raised both my boys here uh, with a Midwestern father and a Midwestern mother and they would come home from school and use words I had never heard in my life. One day my son said, uh-oh, the glass tumped over. Well, I didn't know what tumped meant. I didn't know if it meant it broke, it fell over, it jumped up and down. I don't know what tumped was, okay? But I learned it and now I know what it is. Uh, pronunciation is an accepted standard of sound and rhythm in a given language. There are, you may, if, if, if you've traveled the world or traveled to another country or two, let's say you go to Spain and you've learned Spanish. Well, you've learned Spanish probably from an American an English speaking person trying to teach you Spanish. And then you'll find that, whoa, doesn't sound like that in Spain. It sounds faster, it sounds higher pitch, whatever. Uh, that's what we have to do in America. Uh, if you become a broadcaster, they will try to make you exercise to the point where your accent is gone where nobody can tell where you're from. Uh, the people from Alabama have difficulty with that. They have a very strong Southern accent and it's difficult to rid yourself of that, but it can be done. 
16 is articulation. It's different from pronunciation, but the two go together. It's the physical production of speech sounds. This means speaking so you are understood. If you drop syllables from the ends of your words, if you, like in the South here, a lot of people drop the ing uh, uh, and, and make it in instead of ing. I'm looking, looking around, looking around. That's not good articulation. Articulation is pronouncing everything in the word that is supposed to be pronounced. Remember that. Dialect. Uh, this is a variety of language distinguished by accent, grammar, and vocabulary. So you got a little bit of that when I was telling you about my son coming home from school. So he was learning accent, he was learning vocabulary, and sometimes grammar. We tried to help on the grammar at home. And on slide 18, okay, this, this goes with uh, nonverbal communication. This is your body. You may not realize this, and uh, many of you gave your speeches in a seated position. I want to inform you that you are no longer to sit for your speech. So um, uh, please stand up, uh, allow yourself to use your hands, your, your head, your body, become part of this speech that you're giving. Uh, your movement, your gestures, your eye contact. Uh, what if you say something that's kind of surprising even to you? You might want to do this. Raise your eyebrows a little bit, okay? So your body tells a story in and of itself. On to 19, kinesics. This is the study of body motions as a mode of communication. Uh, if you are ever at a Troy event, you will see that we have some expert American Sign Language people who uh, sign whatever the speaker is saying. For those people in the audience who are um, who cannot hear, or who uh, cannot hear well, or who cannot hear at all, and uh, watch what they do, watch what they do with their body, because they are telling you what they're saying with their body. It's it's really, or get on Google and watch somebody sign something. Uh, you, you'll see how much they put their body into it. So we go to 20, practicing your delivery. Uh, some of you need to practice more. Uh, most of you did a wonderful job. I'm, I'm really proud of what you've done with this difficult situation. You prepare a, a, a preparation outline and go through it aloud. Then prepare a speaking outline, which is a little more detailed. Practice the speech aloud. Polish and refine your delivery and give a dress rehearsal. And practice as many times as it takes. This is the advantage you have, and some people mentioned it. This is the advantage you have to a recorded speech. You can get this thing perfect. I'm allowing you to practice it as many times as you wish and, and upload just the best one, okay? That's fine. I know that's what you're doing, and that's okay. Now, preparing a Q&A, I'm going to, we're not going to do a Q&A, but I want you to know about it anyway. Formulate answers to possible questions and practice the delivery of those answers. So, in other words, let's say you're preparing a persuasive speech and you know that there will be objections to what to your side what you're trying to persuade the audience of so write down a list the people who are against your side what are their likely objections what will they ask you in order to voice their objection how do you answer those prepare to answer those 
and on slide 22, managing the Q&A, uh, not too difficult, approach with a positive attitude and a smile on your face. Uh, listen carefully. Uh, at the end of the speech, you may want to say something uh, rather than, are there any questions, something like, um, are there any questions from audience members about this topic? You don't want them to ask questions about your clothing or your earrings or whatever, okay? Um, listen carefully. Listening is the most important thing. Uh, direct the answers to the entire audience. Be honest and straightforward and stay on track. I'm going to I'm going to say add one more thing here. After I said listen carefully. Remember if you're in a large group. Uh, there are times when I happen to end up sitting in the back of a large group and somebody asked a question and I didn't hear it. And then they give the answer and I'm going, "Well, what was the question?" Because the answer doesn't make any sense without the question. Repeat the question in a nice way. This young lady here just asked, and say it to the whole audience with volume so they can all hear it. Did everybody hear that? Okay, and then you ask the question, and then you answer the question, okay? It's always a good idea to repeat the question that was asked, all right? Okay, moving on to other things.